So I'm sure most of you have heard, all, not all of you, even if you're watching from somewhere around the globe on the internet, that there was a, a terrible tragedy carried out this week in the city of Las Vegas. And I don't know what to feel about it. I don't know how to handle it, I guess. And um, I thought about it a lot. I, I listened, look, watched some news stories. When I get up in the morning, I, I sit down with my breakfast and open my Bible. And then after I'm done with my Bible study, I open my computer to see what's going on in the world. And that morning this week, I opened it up and, and I saw these things had happened in Las Vegas by the hand of one particular man. And as the week went on and more and more came out about this tragedy, how he, how he murdered all these people and, and destroyed lives and families and just the thousands and thousands of people that are affected by this tragedy, I could just feel my heart breaking for these people. The, the people that rushed in to help while others were fleeing in terror, the, all those stories that we've heard just really had an effect on my heart and my understanding. And I had read earlier in the week an article by my friend Linford from Oklahoma. He talked about the compassion that Christ has for us. And I could just see this wide gulf from what I was seeing in the world this week and what we read in the scriptures about the love of God and the love he shows to us through his son. So I'm a little emotional about these things because I just see that it's not going to get any better until God sees fit to put an end to sin in the universe. So uh, the scripture reading that, that uh, I asked for for today was Psalms 51. And it's about your heart and it's about my heart. It's about how God needs to create in each one of us a new heart, a new way of thinking, really. And you know, the Bible just is full of how he wants to do that individually for each one of us. Now, I, I've told most everybody here about how several years ago, I, I was searching for direction in life and Mary said those words to me about, don't you think God has a better plan for your life than you do? You know, that just keeps coming back up. And that's the question I really want to ask this morning. Don't each one of us individually, if we look at ourselves, the things we're involved with in life, God's plan is the best one for our lives. It truly is. So I'm there with David in Psalm 51, where he's asking God to create this new, this clean heart within him. And it, it goes even deeper than that, he wants the spirit of God inside of him. He wants to feel God's presence and know that there's nothing in this world, not even a madman, is going to get in the way of our relationship with God. That it's that intimate, it's that close. So what's interesting is when you read Psalm 51, is that David has just recognized how deep the sin is in his heart. And he's asked God for forgiveness. And he real, he's realized that there's, there's no way he's going to be holy and acceptable before God unless God so, does something inside of him. Unless God does something to change his heart, his mind, his attitudes. And you know, I, I feel the same way about myself. And I'm hoping you do too. A, a month or so ago, Ed gave the sermon, where is the change? 
Not like when you go up to the counter and you pay and, hey, where's my change? It's more like, where is the change that's evident that God has changed your heart and my heart? Do we see that in the way we relate to people? Do we see that in the way we deal with people at work, people at school, with our family members and our loved ones? My first slide this morning is from Mark chapter 7. And I want to focus on what's in our hearts. What's in our hearts today? And he said, as Jesus, that which comes out of a man, that it's that which comes out of man that defiles the man. For from the within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, from your heart. And those are the things that defile us. We've defiled ourselves. We really have. We've chosen it for ourselves, each one of us. But is there an antidote? I think David was on to that antidote. You know, it was just very, very disturbing as I saw more and more news fo footage come out. The, the death toll continued to climb as the days went on. And, you know, there's a lot of people searching for answers, especially in the political realm. My boss got out of his truck one of these mornings and, and said, can you believe that people think that by banning guns, we can do away with all these tragedies. And we talked about that. We're on the same page with that. What does the scripture say? Does the scripture say it's a gun or a sword? The scripture right here says it's my heart and your heart and the heart of this man that did this tragedy. That's where all these evil things came from. It's not the instruments that we have in our hands. And there was a lot of political talk between my boss and I. But really, it's moral talk. It's understanding where these things come from that is so important. And people don't want to talk about those things. They really don't want to talk about the real issues. That my heart, your heart, Jeremiah says, our hearts are deceitful above all things. But there's got to be an antidote. There's got to be an end to all of this at some point. Doesn't there? Because it's just going to keep continuing to happen. It's going to get worse and worse. I don't know when that end is going to come. And even Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 24, but of that day and hour, no man knows, but not even the angels of heaven, but my father only but as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is trying to point us to signs. Signs of the things that are happening now are what those things are what Jesus was pointing to. And I want to go back and look at what it was like, what God actually said the earth was like. It isn't man's opinion. We're going to read straight from Genesis what God thought about the things happening on the earth in the days of Noah. And you know what? I believe you'll agree with me. When we see the violence, we see all the bloodshed, that it's the same as it was in Noah's day. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. If you want to open your Bibles, that's fine, but I've got most of the texts up here on the PowerPoint. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Is there anybody in here that thinks the wickedness isn't great right now in the earth? Every one of us, I think, can raise our hands and say, yeah, we see it every day. Right is being called wrong, and wrong is being purported as it's exactly what you need to do. Your will be done, not God's. That's what the people in the world are saying. And look what it says. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
Now, maybe we haven't gotten quite there yet. Because the only way that there's good in the world, I believe, is because God still dwells in the hearts of men today. And it repented the Lord. In other words, the Lord, that's Jehovah, repented in his heart that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved, it says it grieved him in his heart. That's what it said. How can it get so bad? Let's continue. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, Corey, I didn't, we didn't collaborate on this with the children's story. But this is why the flood took place. It had gotten that bad. And God's going to describe in the next few texts how bad it got. Verses 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's continue. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So this week, I got out of work one day early. My boss had an appointment, and, then, and I could leave a little early, so I thought, you know what? The sign at the church needs to be changed. The sign out front here. And I thought, you know, it needs to be changed to point people to the series, but that was the day that all this violence had happened in, out in Las Vegas. So I, I just wanted a little, little help in what to, what to put on the sign, deciding to put what to put on the sign. I knew it had to be straight from the Bible. I wanted people to understand that we are afraid. We're terrified that something like this might happen in our town to our loved ones. And I wanted people to realize that there's hope beyond what the world gives. There's hope only with the peace Jesus Christ can give us. And that's what the sign says. That I think it's John 4. I don't know what it is. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> but the, the, the verse is 27, but I don't know the chapter. But it's peace that Jesus lives, gives to us. And it's not the peace that the world thinks we ought to have. It's the peace that passes all understanding and peace that no matter what happens, we can rest in Jesus Christ. So I came over and I got everything ready for the sign on the inside. I you know, have these boxes of letters where we change the sign. And I laid them out, all out got everything ready got out there in the heat of the day, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, and I opened the sign and started changing everything. And I heard this sound and it didn't register quite at, quite at first. It was boom, 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 police! Stand in police, open up. And as soon as they said that, I could hear a door being kicked in. With all the things in my mind, I mean, I just was like, I was in shock for three seconds. And I looked over my shoulder and across the street, I saw two policemen in bulletproof vests with their guns drawn. I got up and I came inside the church as quick as I could. <laughs> but you can tell what was going through my mind. Back to Genesis, the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. You know, we were just told that, that Noah was the man that God found that, that walked uprightly with God and his family. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me and the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them from the earth. Is that what we find today? Violence is everywhere. My heart pounding as I came inside the church this week. They were looking for somebody across the street 
and evidently they found somebody, put him in the, in the car out back of the house, but it was shocking to me. I'd never heard a sound like that before. You know, there's an antidote to all these things, and it's fine right here in the Word of God. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be okay and fine with our lives. It doesn't mean that we're never going to get sick. It doesn't mean that we're, going to have, we're not going to have loved ones that pass away. It doesn't mean that the violence won't come to our door. But it does mean that we can have the peace that passes all understanding through Jesus Christ. And it's a gift that God himself has given us. How can we be different and look at things differently in the world than everyone else? Because that peace, we have that peace of Christ inside of our hearts. How can that take place? I mean, there's got to be some practical way where I can have the thoughts, the mind, the understanding of Jesus Christ in my heart and in my mind. There's got to be some practical way. You know, Jesus gave an example of how to look at other people and how to look at the world. He was constantly being persecuted for his beliefs, for the differences that he had that God himself had laid out before him. But you know, he, he never stopped loving people. He really didn't. In fact, he gave us up his very life because he loves us so much, because he decided and the father decided that they were going to have compassion on a human race that chose to turn their back on, on them. That's pretty amazing. I want to turn to the Gospels and just show from the Gospels the example we have of Jesus Christ of how to look at the world today and how to look at other people with compassion and love in our hearts. You know, Jesus said that he is the way right here in John 10, 6. He's the only way that our Heavenly Father has provided for us. There's no other name under heaven whereby we come to the Father. Isn't that true? In Mark chapter 6, I'm going to start with this account of, of Jesus interacting with the people. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart to a desert place and rest for a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Now he's talking to his disciples and all the people that were following him. You see, Jesus was pretty busy all the time. And if there was someone in need, he took care of those needs, even at detriment to his own needs. It says, and they departed unto a desert place by ship privately. And it continues. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all the cities and outwent them or outraced him and came together unto him. They wouldn't leave him alone. The bread of life was so rich to them. And Jesus, when he came out, saw so much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he be began to teach them many things. Jesus had compassion even at detriment to his own rest, his own food, his own well-being, even at detriment to his disciples and their well-being and rest. And when the day was now spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. It's interesting. Jesus wanted to have compassion on the multitude and preach to them all day. When it gets all done, the disciples, these human disciples still full of themselves, want to send the crowd away. But here's what Jesus said. 
give them to eat. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And he said unto them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they said only five loaves and two fishes. And this, I don't have to continue the story. This is when Jesus performed a miracle so that everyone could eat to their fill. Jesus had compassion, self-sacrificing compassion. Matthew 20, here's, an, here's another account. They departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them. What are the people saying? Shut up. We want to listen to Jesus. Don't bother him. The multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. At the times when we're most distracted, by the violence in our world, by how evil people are treating us and others. There's got to be some compassion. There's got to be some love in our hearts. And as we move on, you'll see why that's so terribly important. In the Gospel of Mark, this is recorded. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, I know most of us are familiar with this, especially sitting here in this church. I want to skip over the next part because it's full of doctrine that is beautiful. But really, the end is what I want to focus on. If we move from verse 17 down to verse 21, after they had talked back and forth, it says, then Jesus beholding him, loved him, loved him, and said unto him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come take up your cross and follow me. Above everything else that was said, I want to focus on the fact that Jesus loves those that come to him. Jesus loved those that do his father's commandments. And you know, Jesus even loves those that continue to sin, hoping and praying that they will come out of that sin, keep the commandments of God, and do the will of our Heavenly Father. Because he died for everyone while we were yet sinners, is what the Bible says. It's hard to see how Jesus could have any love for the person responsible for all the tragedy out in Las Vegas. It's really hard for me to understand that. You know, it's not just Jesus that loves us, but it's the Father who loves us too. And Jesus told us that. He said, the Father himself loves you. In fact, when one of the disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus kind of rebuked him and said, I've been with you this whole time. I've revealed the Father this whole time. I've revealed his love and compassion. If you can't see these things by now, when are you going to see them? It's hard for me to have love for someone who would do something like this man did out in Las Vegas. We hear all the time, love the sinner, but hate the sin. 
But that's what we see with the example of Jesus Christ. He loves each one of us. You know, in Revelation, Jesus talks about chapter 3. Is, it's a very important chapter in Revelation because I think all of us with a little study can understand that, that this is revealed, this section of Revelation 3 is talking about our time right now. In fact, I have that in my Bible, open to it right here. It's written to the church, the angel of the church of Laodicea. And the vast majority of churches and lay people and anyone who has any study of the Bible recognizes that these are the words that are given to us at the end of time. In verse, I have verse 19 down. But I want to back up if you want to look it up in your own Bible and read verse 17 and 18. Speaking to the church, he says, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Is that what we say today? I don't need to love people like Jesus loved them. I don't need to have compassion in my heart because I'm right. Because I have the correct doctrine, I don't need these other things. He says, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable. And he says, and poor and blind and naked. We don't have the richness of the character of Christ in us the love and compassion for other people. We may be able to see in a little, little limited bit, but if we had the eyes of Jesus Christ, his vision, we could see tremendously more clearly. And when we look at ourselves, do we see Christ's righteous robe, his pure robe of white linen on us? Or are there things in our lives that we understand we need to get rid of? So in verse 18, Christ counsels us. He says, buy of me gold tried in the fire. That faith that comes from wrestling with these issues. That faith, gift of faith that we are given. And then we can be rich, he says. And white raiment, that raiment, that righteousness that only Christ can give us, that we can be clothed and that the shame of our nakedness would not be evident. And then he says, I salve, understanding, wisdom, all these gifts come from Jesus Christ. There's an antidote to what the world is putting out there. And it all is found in the Son of Almighty God. But here in verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke. And he's pointing to me and to you. And he's saying, look, repent. The time is now. The earth is violent. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. But here's the promise he gives. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is the antidote to everything the world has to offer. All the evil, all the violence. And here's the promise in the next verse also. To him that overcomes this world, overcomes everything in this world, will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame. He overcame everything. And he sat down with his father in his throne. It's a beautiful promise. We can have Christ's victory if we have Christ inside of us but we've got to welcome him in. It needs a change. 
It needs a change in our heart or we're just going to end up being like the world with violence and malice in our hearts. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, Paul describes that change. He says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? Everything that has to do with God, his perfection, his righteousness. We see all that and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. But we have to keep our focus on what God is putting before us even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's Him that does the work. Him through Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 17. This is Paul praying. He's praying for you and for me. How about that? For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, who's that? That's the father of the whole, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're named after the father. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. It's the same love that the Father has, which passes knowledge or understanding that you might be filled with all the fullness of love. It says God there, but God is love filled with all the fullness of God. Are we going to be like the world? Are we going to have attitudes and understandings like this man had out in Las Vegas where we just can't take it anymore? Or are we going to rely on Jesus Christ? We're going to rely on what our Heavenly Father has given us in his son. Beloved, in 1 John 4, 7, 4, 7 to 9, it says, Beloved, let us one, love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loves not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. You think for a minute this man out in Las Vegas, if he had even an ounce of the love of God, he would have done the things that he did. Not for a minute. And my final text this morning is from Proverbs chapter, chapter 4, verses 20 to 23. God is asking us to keep all these things in our hearts and minds. That the wisdom that he gives us from his scripture is going to lead to that loving kindness, that compassion that Christ had. But we have to keep it there. We have to cling to it. We have to cling to Jesus. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ears unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, in the center of everything that is you and me. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life.